Sir, you're charged with especially aggravated kidnapping. You're also charged with aggravated assault. And you're charged with theft of a firearm worth less than $2,500. You're talking about stuff that is not relevant. Hello and welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. I am the recovery addict and boy do I have a case for you today. Why is a dog Whoa. chewing on this guy? I think they have got the wrong guy they there. Got the wrong guy and the dog was, was biting him. He roughing him up quite a bit. There's a lawsuit. Nine out of ten judges prefer watching the recovery addict live stream in their court. The fireworks are not done. Now we're getting commentary on the table. Dr. Mihi Angli Khan, Marine Service, Montana. That's literally not true. I didn't ask you to interrupt me. Is that correct? Nine out of ten. Scratch all that. Oh, that was terrible. I apologize. I hit one wrong button, one wrong, wrong button, and I messed up the whole intro. Welcome. Welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. It's great to have you here with us. We are uh, we're getting set to, uh, to get going here. Let's see. We've got uh, our thumbnail is in the works. I think I got a lot of people added. I think it was a lot. It was like four or five people. Four or five people that get permission to uh, to edit the picture. Nine out of ten what? Says Red Pan. Nine out of ten what? All right. Ah, oh, the sweet smell of PVC primer and glue. Mmm, delicious. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Please take a seat. We're going to take uh, take on part two of the uh, court case for Let's see, there's day one. Now I just need day two. Let's see, day one. Don't make me hunt for it again. Oh, that's no no bueno, no bueno. Let's see, yeah, you're live. You're live. Um, you want to go through there? There you go. You're good. Why am I blurry? Oh, a little better. There we go. That's good. All right. Uh, do we have an outhouse since your bathroom is just demolished? Yes, I have. I have an outhouse. I have an Airbnb, which is a full. It's a full house. It's a two bedroom, one kitchen, one bath, um, detached prop, detached building, power, water. All that is still working just fine. Um, but uh, let's see. We're. Uh, let's see. Let's go back here. I'm trying to get the uh, the thumbnail pulled up. You don't see two of me right now. Let's turn that off for a second. I need... There's day one. I do have to go. I have to... Are you serious? I've got to scroll through all this. Through two years of videos. Okay. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, 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 zoom. Still in 2024. We are clicking, we're clicking. Now we're in 2023. That's good. One more, two more years to go. Uh, 2023 still. Twenty twenty two. We're getting we're getting a lot closer. Getting a lot closer. Um I missed one. I missed one what? What did I miss? Okay. Getting very, very close. Criminal docket. My thumb is getting a cramp in it. This is this is hard work, guys. I'm not I'm not cut out to scroll this far. There we go. Twenty twenty one. Ten, nine. Eight. I should have done this during the break. This 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 is the sort of thing that would have been um Someone with more experience would have done this during the break and had it all ready. I did it on my on my computer, but I, I needed to play from my, with more <laughs> yes. Experience. That's what I'm saying. I needed to play it from somewhere else. Okay, uh, day one point two, one point one. There's oh, here we are. Day two, and it's two point two. There's no there's no point one. So here we go. When are we going to break for lunch, Judge? Oh, there we go. We are back. We are back. Apparently they're breaking everything. We need 
away from General Crouch. Okay, as far as as far as viewing the uh, right, well, what I wanted to do is just point to a couple of things. When I went through the transcript, um, as far hang on one second, Judge Wolf, if you if you'll hold your thought just for a second, as far as viewing the the uh, the uh, thumbnail goes, there is a link in the description of the video that will take you to the view only page of the uh, of the thumbnail, and we may we may add more. I. I'm trying to screen everyone that we add, so I make sure I know them. I'm familiar with them. If if it's the first time you've ever texted the burner phone and you're asking for access, I might might wait for a little bit, um, just to to see uh, those that we have a little more history with. I need to make sure we don't have somebody like the the troll we had before that came in and just tried to ruin have it for them everybody. Send someone with more experience. So uh, anyway, the, if you if you need a link to view the editing as it's going live, uh, that that link is available. No longer no, no, needed. We, break for lunch. we were talking about earlier we're return last night and then this morning. There were a couple of things that caught my eye that I wanted to just touch base to make sure everyone's on the same page. Oh, on SF page in Texas. Three of the transcript, if you have it handy. First in chat, SF in Texas. In Internet's all yours. It, uh, and then continuing to page 84, and I notice in this redacted one, it has... Um, Mr. Wiggins on page 83, line 25, says, I got a bunch of violations against me on, and then Agent Lee says, how much paper are you on? Five, 10, three, Agent Lee's 18. Mr. Wiggins, yeah, and they're all consecutive. Um, that is still in the transcript, and I just wanted to, I understand there's a theory, but that's the basis upon which he did not want to be taken into uh, custody. Uh, it's, and I'm fine to leave it in there if everyone else is, but I wanted to make sure we all are on the same page. All right. Being no other uh, discussion about that, we'll leave, and page 85, um, there was some question about whether the statement made. I understand that last part. And it coming right after Mr. Wiggins had, that we had locked out the first part of Mr. Wiggins' statement, but then he said, I've had people try to pull things on me. And Agent Lee says, I understand that last part. I got you. He gets risky, especially this day and age, so you carry a gun. That part, I don't think there's really any issue, but I had flagged it just to, to make sure we're all on the same page. And again, on page 100, lines 14 through 15, it talks about, um, because I know I've got two active warrants on me. That's the only question I have about that. Your Honor, and that, that was, I, I don't have an issue with that. I think mean, that, that was on the state. That was the state. All right. I just wanted, again, this is just for you know, clarity's sake and to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm not suggesting they should be omitted. I'm just wanting to discuss pages, uh, page 106 and lines 8 through 14. With, I had, look, uh, there was some information there about um, the 22. It was a different gun, different, it was a 22 revolver. Agent Scarborough then says, okay, and Agent Lee says, that you pulled on her. Mr. Wiggins says, yeah. Your Honor, yeah. I'm sorry, Your Honor. We had agreed to uh, redact that entire page. Okay. So 106 is going to be redacted. Yes, Your Honor. All right. I, I'm just going by what you said was the one that you had agreed upon, and so that's fine. Page 113. Lines 9 through 11 regarding, again, warrants. And uh, the same thing, Mr. Evans, are you okay with that? Page 113, 9 through 11. Basically says the reason I've been packed up to move out of state is because when y'all raided my house looking for me on warrants. I don't have any problems leaving it in. I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention so it was not overlooked. So. No issue. All right. Same thing with 19 through 22, about him packing up to go out of state. And on page 116, lines 22 through 23, which says you were running, no issues with any of that, correct? No issue. All right. Then those are um, my only concerns about wanting to make sure that the transcript is correct. And uh, with those, I think you saw the big one, which was that one page you said was just going to be omitted. 
Are we ready? I think the jury was the jury was still trying to get them all back together. Is that right? All right, they're all up, and we're ready to bring them in. Are we ready to bring them in? Yeah, just take that. Mr. Mr. Wyatt, can I see you, Mr. Evans, for a moment? Uh, Stephen, X-Row, I, I show you have access. Check your yeah, we, check we your uh, let people in that Gmail. We, uh, want to have in, so I don't know what that's inferring to you. But. I actually asked him to do it. So. <laughs> um, just there was just one page here that this this one we've obliterated that and we've left his name there. It just seems to, I assume that a copy of this going to be given to the jury or what? Are you just going to are you going to hand this? I was planning it's just a show what the loss of the video. All right, well then, that won't matter. Okay. There's just this one spot where there's the button. Yeah. Okay. You got me that. Let me just. I do it just. It's like. Uh, you're going to play this as an audio with those omissions? Yes. Everything's in blue. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I would just remind you of what we had an old judge that I used to practice in front of, and he used to always tell me when I get up to argue about something, and he'd say, don't ask for something you're not sure you want, because you might get it. So you asked to go late tonight. <clears throat> We're going to see how uh, far we can get in this uh, case. Uh, State may call your next witness. Your State calls uh, Agent Heather Hammond. Heather Hammond. Is that still allow you to finish tomorrow? Let's sort of finish tomorrow. Yes. Oh, yeah. Michaela, if you email me um, in the email, just uh, say. Give me your well. I'll get your email address. I'm just asking the email for access to the um, to the thumbnail. Uh, if you have a phone in this courtroom, you need to uh, turn it off. I think I think I'm not going to mess with it right now. I've got a couple of media going on. representative that's allowed to use their phone, but if your phone's going off. <clears throat> make sure it is silent. Uh, it's going to be a bit before I add anything to it. Man. Wyatt, you may ask. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Asia. Good afternoon. If you would make sure you speak, scoot up and speak in the microphone for us. Yes, sir. If you would, uh, state your name for the record, please. My name is Heather Hammond. If you would, uh, spell your last name, please. H-A-M-M-O-N-D. Thank you. Agent, who are you employed by? I'm currently employed with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and the National Crime Laboratory. And how long have you been with the TBI Crime Lab? I've been with the TBI since 2015. Uh, prior to that, what did you do for a living? And prior to that, I uh, worked at Aegis Sciences Corporation, and before that, I had gone to school for forensic science. So while we are discussing your educational background, uh, what sort of degree or any degrees that you may have? I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Forensic Science from Middle Tennessee State University. Do you have any uh, professional affiliations? 
Yes, I am a member of the International Association for Identification, and I'm also a member of the Tennessee Division of the International Association for Identification. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Going to try to cut out all the background noise a little bit. Agent, do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. What is that document? Uh, this is a copy of my uh, CD. And a particular note, uh, down at the bottom of the second page, have you uh, taught any courses? Uh, yes. What have you taught in the past? Um, I've taught latent print um, courses uh, at MTSU, or Middle Tennessee State University, as well as um, courses through the Tennessee IAI as far as their student dates are concerned. Thank you. You're asked the CV made the next next exhibit in this trial. Exhibit one eighty four. Yes, sir. Okay, agent, um, within the TBI crime lab, what area do you specialize in? I specialize in latent prints. How long or how much experience do you have with latent prints? I started in latent prints in two thousand and fifteen, so it'd be the whole time that I've been there. What sort of training did you receive in order to perform your job? During my time starting with the TBI, I completed a course with the TBI working side by side with court qualified examiners, processing evidence for the presence of latent prints, being able to uh, develop those latent prints, compare, submitted, and develop latents to known impressions, and writing reports based off of results. During that time, I also read a lot of books and journal articles on the premise of latent prints. I also gave presentations, did proficiency tests, and I also um, qualified as far as a mock trial is concerned. After that, I have continued my education in latent prints by taking courses trial. outside of the TBI, and I've also um, done a presentation as a speaker for research at an international conference. Thank you. Outside of your uh, jobs in, in latent examinations, what other Functions do you perform with TBI? Uh, with the TBI, I'm also a member of the Violent Crime Response Team. And what do you do as part of the VCRT? On the VCRT, I am the latent print examiner on the scene. You're on the state of tender, uh, Agent Hamlet, as an expert. No objection. All right, she'll be tendered as an expert. Uh, she'll be qualified, rather, by the court as an expert on latent prints. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, on uh, May 30th of 2018, did you respond to Dixon County as far as, the, as part of the BCRT? Yes, sir, I did. If you would, kind of tell the jury what you learned and then what you did as you got here in Dixon County. Um, upon arriving at the TBI, uh, I was briefed by Laura Bose about a uh, crime that had happened. Um, we were told that it was... There were two scenes, they were a mile apart. I'm just reading from my notes, if that's okay. Best you can from your recollection will be preferred. Okay. Um, but there were two scenes, they were about a mile apart from each other. There was an initial scene where a traffic stop had happened, and then there was another scene where there was a police vehicle with the police, um, a, the police officer inside, and that the vehicle had been attempted to be burned. Which scene did you respond to specifically? Uh, the first thing that I responded to was the vehicle. I'm sorry, the burned vehicle. Thank you. Once you arrived at that particular scene, what, what did you do? Um, at that particular scene, um, the very beginning of it was just um, getting, a, getting a briefing from one of the agents that was on the scene. And then um, being able to get down to that scene to kind of see what was going on. At that point, um, I was pulled away to go to the scene where the original traffic stop had taken place. And at that point, I transferred over to that scene and did a videotaping. While you were on the scene of the typical switch in San Antonio Road, did you uh, do any collection of evidence or anything of that nature? At that scene, I do not believe that I did. Now, as part of your uh, work on this particular case, did you ever collect any evidence in this case? Yes, sir, I did. Well, um, if you would tell us 
where you collected it, where it was collected from, those sorts of things. Sure. So to begin with, while I was at while I was at the scene of the police vehicle, I was able to um, develop a latent print on the outside of the vehicle. I took photographs of that latent print, and then I also lifted that print and brought that back in for evidence. Uh, from there, the I believe that was the only thing that I collected on the scene. Um, everything else was collected. Um, that I collected was from the Saturn once it was back in the TBI custody at the lab. You want to make a push list? You may. Agent, do you recognize that photograph? Yes, I do. Is that the same photograph that's on the screen here? Yes, sir, it is. If you would uh, describe from your perspective the significance of this particular photograph. Um, this would be how the vehicle is found minus the canopy that's over the top of it. Um, there is the front driver's door is closed, the back driver door is open, and um, Sergeant Baker is inside and outside of the vehicle. Now, a moment ago, you spoke of collecting latent, latent prints from that scene, correct? Yes, that's correct. Could you describe to the jury where you collected those prints from? Sure. So the print that I collected on this vehicle is, if you're looking at the open door, as close to where it folds into the, the front driver door, um, up close to where the window is. If you would, please feel free to stand up and go point the screen. That would help the jury understand exactly where you're speaking. It's a long walk across the courtroom. Within this area here. Thank you. Thank you. This so you can identify it. Grip bottoms, thank you. By the way. Yes, I can. If you would tell the jury what that is. So this is a um, this is waiting list and a CD of the waiting list from that vehicle from that uh, from that list. Thank you. Your last that be moved as the next exhibit. One eighty five. Now, I want to circle back and talk about your examination here in just a moment. Now, let's skip ahead in, in, a, in a little bit and let's talk about anything that you may have collected from the 98 Saturn while it was at TBI headquarters in the laboratory. Is it okay if I look at my notes for this? I, I have no problem with it. Any objection to a refreshment of memory from the notes? Oh, you're right. Agent, you may refresh your memory from your notes. Thank you, sir. There's no objections from the uh, defense on almost anything here. Uh, this hat is a mine lab hat. So as far as the inventory that was done on the Saturn, the company there were that makes specific pieces that were collected. Um, specifically, there was a cartridge case that was found on the front passenger floorboard. There was a cartridge case found in the glove box, um, a projectile that was found on the front driver's floorboard, a cartridge case from the front driver's seat, and a cartridge case from the driver's rear floorboard. All right, so I'm going to start talking about these individually. If you would identify this. Mark for the laboratory is 59A. Yeah, exhibit 59A is a cartridge case from the front passenger floorboard of the Saturn. Thank you. Stand up here. But that can be made the next exhibit. 
Exhibit 60A is the cartridge case from the glove box of the Saturn. This is 61A, and this is the projectile from the front driver floorboard of the Saturn. 188. 62A. 62A is a cartridge case from the front driver's seat of the Saturn. 63A. That one would be 189. 63A is a cartridge case from the driver rear floorboard of the Saturn. That one would be 190. 66 and 66A is a cartridge from the ashtray in the front passenger floorboard of the Saturn. That will be one ninety-one. Right, so just to be clear, you simply collected these cartridge, these specific exhibits, correct? That is correct. Did you do any testing on them? No, I did not. Does another agent with TBI perform that testing? Yes. Thank you. Keeping an eye on a manhunt going on in Idaho right now. A uh, prisoner taken to a hospital. Actually, this state is three officers shot. Did you collect it? No good information sources yet, other than a couple news updates, but. No scanner traffic, it says it no air fires. traffic control. Oh, let's see. The exhibit number is 142A. These are fires from the driver's side floorboard of the Saturn. And I did not collect these. Okay. If you would, Agent, tell me on the package who in fact did collect those. It looks like the original seal is from SC, which I believe would be Shelly Carmen. Thank you. I'll take that back. And then if I could see. Previously, uh, admitting it in exhibit, excuse me, 177. Kathy, I know it's in the Boise area. But I don't know which way he's headed. This is exhibit 95A, and this is cell phone parts from the driver's floorboard of Ford. Did you conduct an examination on that particular device? Yes, sir, I did. Jam Jam, thank you very much for your support. Congratulations on your second month. Now, this isn't the only item that you tested, is that correct? No, sir, it's not. So to make this a little bit easier, let's go through what what we have as exhibits to this, and let's talk about briefly what was tested and what you could not find any identifiable prints on. So we'll start with the top. Did you test uh, item 11A, the key card? Yes, sir. I did. Were there any identifiable prints? No, there were not. And then for uh, 12A? I did test 12A, and there was no latent print risk detail. Uh, 14A? 14A, I tested, and there was no latent print risk detail. And then items 21, 22, and 23A? 21, 22, and 23A, I did test, and there was no ridge development and no uh, identifiable ridges. Okay. So now that you've brought up the terms, uh, like ridge elements, it, if you would, describe to the jury what you're looking for 
when you actually do go, do go to test them. When I'm processing evidence for the presence of latent pranks, I am looking for ridge detail that's associated with your fingers, palms, and the soles of your feet. It's the elevated ridges that's on those fingers and soles and palms. So anytime that you touch an object, the sweat and oils from your fingers could be left on top of an object. And so it takes processing in order to make those visible. And so during that processing, I'm looking for those elevated ridges. How are those prints developed? The prints are developed in quite a few different ways. Uh, it depends on the type of object that I'm dealing with. Depend that would, um, that would afford me the opportunity to figure out which type of processing that I need. For a lot of the evidence that was in this case, I used non-porous processing. And non-porous processing is, or non-porous items are kind of what I described where the print's going to lay on the top of that piece of evidence, such as plastic or metal or glass. Now, since you brought up the, the glass, on the cell phone of exhibit, the Latin exhibit 95A, what sort of material is that? You recall? Uh, the, the front of the cell phone would have a glass cover over it, and the back of the cell phone is more or less a flat surface. Um, it can be cons considered plastic. Now, with that, uh, which, as I said earlier, was it's been previously admitted as Exhibit 177 to this trial, were you able to develop or identify any latent prints on that particular piece of evidence? Yes, on Exhibit 95A, the examination revealed the presence of two identifiable latent fingerprints. Let's go a little bit further. Next page. Down the results, please. All right, a little bit further down, please. So in this section, thank you, that's called, this says comparison. How do you take a print that is developed and compare it to someone, a known person? To take a print that's been developed to compare it to a known person, um, I first take the known individual's information, such as their name and their date of birth, I will look up that information in the automated fingerprint identification system. Um, it's called the APHIS system. And if there is a known individual that has that, that specific name and birth date, then, and they have a card on file, I will be able to then print off that fingerprint card. From there, I will look at the fingerprint card of all 10 fingers up against my unknown developed print. And I'll look at them side by side to see if I see any um, any characteristics that are in common with my unknown print to the known individual or the known fingerprint. And in the case of with that cell phone, were you able to make the comparison of the a print found on the back of that cell phone? Yes, one of the prints I was able to make an identification. And if you would tell the jury about how that uh, print was found and who it belonged to. Uh, the print um, in question is what my uh, report says is L06, so it's the latent number six. And it was identified to the right index number two finger of Stephen Joshua Wiggins. And it was developed on the back cover of the cell phone from the driver floorboard of the floor. And then, as I think, as you just talked about this, but I want to be clear that L06, latent 06. Was that developed from the APHIS system? As far as my identification? Yes. No, it was not. Where was it identified from? Um, all I did was pull his fingerprint card, and I made the identification myself. And where did you find the fingerprint card from? The fingerprint card came from APHIS. Thank you. Now, there's two other identifications, uh, L04 and L05 that are from uh, two other exhibits. If you would, let's talk about those. Specifically, L04 was developed from uh, your exhibit 002, which was the Saturn LS. That's, yes, right? that's correct. And were you able to find a fingerprint of Stephen Wiggins on that? 
vehicle. Yes, L04 was identified to the right little number five finger of Joshua Stephen Wigan, Wiggins, and it was from the front passenger exterior window. And then in uh, L05. That was uh, identified to the right middle finger, uh, the number three middle finger of Stephen Joshua Wiggins, and it was developed from a Diet Mountain Dew bottle that was from the rear passenger floorboard of the Saturn. We just talked about the cell phone in L06, and to be clear, that was found in the driver floor, floorboard of the Ford? That is correct. If we could, let's discuss the, what's inconclusive about L07 and why it's inconclusive. So, as far as Leighton Prince is concerned, an inconclusive conclusion can mean a few different things. One is that on the fingerprint cards, there's not enough area that has been recorded uh, for the area that I have on the latent print. It could be that the area never, uh, like if it's a palm print that I don't have palms on file, so it'd be inconclusive because I can't compare that. Um, it can be inconclusive because the latent print is distorted that I may not be able to make a, make a complete identification. Um, in this case, it was that the, um, the latent print was a very high tip area, so it's really high up on the finger, and that is not recorded on any of the fingerprint cards. Thank you. And finally, in L08, if you would tell the jury about your findings for that particular print. So L08 was identified to the left ring, or the number nine finger, of Stephen Joshua Wiggins, and it was developed from um, exhibit 001, which was the Ford. It was the exterior driver rear door. Is that from the photograph we saw previously? Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, did you attempt to retrieve uh, prints from exhibits 50 and 51A, which are the high point pistol and the Glock 33 pistol? Yes, sir, I did. Were you able to obtain any prints from there? No, I was not. Were there any other uh, finding, significant findings uh, from your report? Uh, there were other latent prints, and they were identified to other individuals. Yeah, let's talk about that. So these other individuals, how did you, I guess, come into contact with her to know that they may have their prints on a particular uh, piece of evidence? When I developed all eight latent prints, I originally compared them to Joshua Stephen Wiggins, Erica Ann Castro Miles, and Daniel Scott Baker. I then made those comparisons and made identifications. The remaining latent prints that I was unable to identify, I searched them through the APHIS database and I was able to get a correlation. And so therefore I had an I had an individual's state identification number. I had an image and I was able to make an identification and be able to find who, who that person or who that state identification number belonged to. And who did you determine that these prints uh, belonged to? There was one print that belonged to a Jeffrey Ross McLeese. McLeese? McLeese, my apologies. And two prints uh, were identified to Todd Everett Heath. And where were the, uh, the prints to? Uh, Mr. McLeod and Mr. Heath found? Uh, Mr. Heath's prints were found on the upper, the upper interior passenger front door. Of which vehicle? Of the Ford. Okay. And then what about with uh, Mr. McLeod? Mr. McLeod was found on the same door as the Stephen Wings. Thank you very much. So if you recognize this document. Yes, it appears to be a copy of my report. Is that what we've been looking at up here? Yes, sir. I asked that be made the next to the yard. The 192. I'll pass the witness. Cross examine. No way. Thank you, Agent. You may step down. You are released from your subpoena. Thank you, Your Honor. No cross once again. Yeah, I just need to make sure that 
the uh, Judge. Miranda. Judge one. Oh, she need water. No, she has it. She has it. Oh. We weren't going to give you any secondhand water to take your medicine with. We were going to give you a fresh bottle if you need to. All right. My cat just the got in a place. fight with a lizard. The lizard's call winning. Agent Kyle Osborne. The lizard bit his ear. <laughs> the lizard bit his ear. <laughs> Defense is doing nothing here at this point. There, I, I imagine there will be something. Here, raise soon. hand and face our court, please. Please sign this way or firm the testimony given this case for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah. Thank you. Afternoon, Agent. Yeah. If you would state your name for the court, please. Kyle Osborne. If you would spell your last name, please. O S B O R N E. And, uh, Agent Osborne, what do you do for a living? I'm employed at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation National Crime Laboratory as a forensic scientist assigned to the microanalysis unit. Specifically the microanalysis unit, what do you do? Uh, so within that unit, I do testing involving uh, glass comparisons, gunshot primer residues, chemical unknowns, and headband uh, uh, analysis. Can you guys tell me if this link is working for you? We're having some trouble with uh, Spring. Let's see if it works. Yeah, approach with it, sir. You may. Agent, do you recognize that document? Yes, sir, I do. And if you would, uh, uh, let the jury know what you're looking at. Okay. This All right. Uh, I've got a ticket in with them trying to get this fixed. Here should be a copy Thank of you. my uh, CV. And if you would, let's start at the top. Uh, discusses your education, correct? Uh, yes, sir, it does. And uh, what degrees do you have? So I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Vanderbilt University, as well as a master's in science in chemistry from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And then as far as your... Employment, we discussed that you work for the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. How long have you been there? So I've been employed at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation for just about seven years now. What did you do before, before that? Uh, before that, uh, I was a teaching assistant at Georgia Tech while I was doing my graduate work. Uh, those are the only employment, the only employment. Uh, what sort of training do you have in order to be a special agent with a crime lab? Yeah. In addition to my formal education, after being hired at the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, for each area that I do testing in, I undergo an in-house training. So, for example, for analysis of gunshot primer residues, I did a year-long training that involved reading uh, scientific literature that's uh, peer-reviewed published articles out uh, in the scientific community as well as doing projects looking at how gunshot residues form, uh, how those uh, samples can be analyzed to find gunshot primal residue, and how gunshot residue is uh, deposited and remains on articles of clothing or people's hands. Uh, I also did supervised um, casework and competency tests. All of this cum uh, accumulated in a mock case uh, showing that I could do the required testing and get appropriate results. Mr. Osborne, have you ever testified as an expert before? Uh, yes, sir, I have. In what areas? I have testified um, in the areas of microanalysis, glass comparisons and direction of force, gunshot primer residue identification, uh, and uh, general chemical unknowns. Thank you. Now, before we move any further. In this particular case, uh, what sort of work would you actually do? Uh, so in this uh, particular case, I analyzed uh, items of evidence that were submitted to the laboratory, uh, processed them for gunshot residue, some of them, and 
I look for those residues as well as the process samples that have been previously collected uh, for a gunshot armor residue. You are know, tender the uh, Agent Osborne as an expert in gunshot residue. Any objection? Objection. All right, he'll be tendered as a uh, qualified rather as by the court as an expert in microanalysis and gunshot, gunshot residue. Thank you. As part of your job with TBI, are you also a member of the violent crime response team? Uh, yes, sir, I am. And how long have you been with BCRT? I've been serving on. Uh, the violent crime response team for, let's say, approximately five years now. When you're called out as part of VCRT, what are your typical duties? So typically, uh, as part of the violent crime response team, I, in addition to the normal duties of documenting, uh, photographing, Taking a good representation of the scene, I specifically look forward uh, to collect and preserve evidence related to microanalysis or the trace evidence unit. And in this case, did you respond with the VCRT on May 30th, 2018 to Dixon County? Uh, yes, sir, I did. If you would describe for the jury what you did that day. So on that day, um, I responded to the scene and uh, uh, assisted the collection and documentation of the scene. Um, in addition, at one point along the side of a road were potential uh, shoe impressions that I documented and casted uh, for further analysis at the lab. When you say documentation, you system with documentation, what do you specifically mean? Uh, specifically, that would be photographing mostly the areas where the evidence would be located. Yeah, for sure. You might. Agent Osborne, if you would, um, can you recognize this document? Yes, this is a copy of my official microanalysis report for my gunshot crime residue testing. Now, if you would, explain to the jury what gunshot primer residue is. When a gun is fired, the uh, first thing that has to happen is to trigger this bolt. When this occurs, it's going to set off a chain reaction that's eventually going to lead to the projectile leaving the end of the barrel. Uh, but the first step uh, in that chemical reaction is going to cause that burning and that uh, projectile to escape the barrel is going to be either the hammer, um, in the case of something like a, a revolver, or the firing pin, in the case of pistol, to strike the primer on the back of a cartridge. So when this occurs, in that primer are going to be a mixture of chemical compounds. And those chemical compounds are going to contain elements like antimony, barium, and lead. These are three relatively heavy metals that aren't really present in most of our day-to-day -day lives. So when the primer or the firing pin strikes that primer, uh, the force is going to cause those chemicals to start to burn very intensely. And that intense burning is going to send flame into the gunpowder to burn the gunpowder and eventually force the projectile out of the barrel. But as those uh, chemicals burn up, they're going to turn into gas and they're going to expand very rapidly. When that happens, they're going to try to escape the weapon in any way they can because they built up so much pressure. Uh, so some of the ways they can escape is out of the the barrel. Uh, they can also escape through any small little gaps or openings in the weapon. So around the gaps around the trigger, or in the case of a semi-automatic, uh, when the weapon cycles and ejection port is open, um, any small little gaps, those gases are going to escape. When they do, uh, those gases still contain those three elements, the antimony, barium, and lead. And as they expand, they're going to cool very quickly. 
when that happens, they're going to condense into small microscopic particles that are going to slowly fall in the area around where that gun was fired. Those small particles are going to look like they condensed from the vapor, so they're going to be rounded, uh, and then they're going to contain those three elements that I've been talking about, the antimony, barium, and lead. Uh, so uh, when we do the analysis, we are looking for those small microscopic and round particles that have antimony, barium, and lead. And those are particles from a firearm being discharged. Now, in general, is there any way to quantify or know how much the, these particles, how far they'll spread in an area? There have been studies uh, to that effect, and in perfect conditions, indoors, without wind, uh, to the size of a gun being fired, they can spread anywhere you know, from six to nine, ten feet, uh, but down range they can go much further and tend to follow the trajectory of the bullet. However, atmospheric conditions like wind, uh, humidity, all of those things can greatly affect where those particles can be deposited. Because they are settling out of the air, something like wind could, could blow them one way or another. Now, Agent Osborne, on May 30th, did you respond to the scene at Tidmill Switch and St. Vineyard Road as part of BCR team? Yes, I believe I did, but those are not the notes that I had. That's about me. And that was what I'm getting at is the Saturn, there's a Saturn 98 Saturn at that, at that scene. Based on what, you're, what you just said, if someone is sitting inside of a car, and a gun goes off, where would you generally expect gunpowder gun residue to disperse? So generally, if a weapon was fired inside of a vehicle, uh, given the range of those can spread, I would not be surprised to find it all throughout that vehicle. Um, this is, this type, these types of residues are not just primarily on the person firing the weapon, but they can be on people around them. It is a, a range that they can end up on. Madam Clerk, if I could see Exhibit 121. While she's being mad, there are a number of items that you tested with on board. If you would go through uh, those items and um, if you could tell us how you came to be in possession of them. So for each of these items, are there any in particular you'd like me to cover or just that all of them? Just, just briefly in general, um, I guess what I'm asking is, did somebody from TBI collect each of these items that you tested? Yes, so each of these items would have been collected by someone uh, prior to me getting them. Uh, each of these um, items would have been uh, transferred to me within the laboratory. Thank you. Now, previously, uh, Agent Miranda Gaddis testified at trial, and uh, she testified about collecting this next exhibit on my hand to you, so you can identify it. <laughs> Do you recognize that item? Yes, I do. Uh, so this is our lab exhibit number 58, um, and it would have been uh, gunshot residue stubs collected from Saturn. What are collection stubs? So when, when GSR is collected, um, because it is just these small microscopic particles that end up on clothing or skin, we use a small aluminum disc uh, with an adhesive layer on the top of it uh, to basically tab the areas that may have gunshot residues and the sticky nature of the stuff is going to pick up those residues for analysis at the laboratory. And so once you get these stubs, what do you do with them? Do you have to do anything to process them in order to come to a conclusion? So once I have these in the laboratory, I 
I mean, I'll, I'll write up the packaging, uh, document everything about the samples, and those uh, small stubs will be coated with a very thin layer of carbon to aid our analysis. And then they are uh, examined using a specialized microscope that lets you both see the shape of the particles as well as their chemical composition. So in this particular instance with these stubs, what did uh, conclusions were you able to come to? So for the uh, stubs from the Saturn, uh, my analysis showed that there were particles identified as gunshot primer residue on those stubs. Now, with it's gunshot that going to all this, residue, are you able, all this effort, is it even possible for you to tell not disputed. which gun this residue came from? So because uh, primer composition is fairly uh, uniform, there are small changes, but not a lot of major ones, uh, as well as because of the really effects of the gun. Uh, residues produced from a weapon or a weapon ignition can't be matched back. So basically, what can you tell from your tests? So uh, when gunshot primer residues are found, uh, it indicates that the exhibit was, if it was from, say, a vehicle, that this vehicle was near the gun when it was fired or came in contact with a recently fired gun or ammunition. It doesn't say, right, like you were saying, that, uh, that the residues had to have come from a particular gun, only from a gun that had been fired. Now, with gunshot residue, is it a, um, I guess, a, a delicate matter? or can it withstand weather or washing or anything of that nature? Uh, gunshot primer residues are of a fairly delicate uh, state. Um, they are very pretty easily removed by washing, rinsing, um, wiping. All of those things will remove some, if not most, of the present particles. You're asked if the report from Agent Osborne will be made in the next exhibit. 193. Now, were there other items that did in fact test positive for gunshot residue based on your uh, analysis? There was uh, one other item, Exhibit 3A, that did test positive. And if, what is 3A in your photo lab? Uh, so Exhibit 3A would have been the pink jacket from Erica Castro-Miles. And it tested positive for Dutch others as well? Yes, sir, it did. I'll pass it with the show. Any questions, Mr. Evans? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Afternoon, Agent Osborne. Ooh, I think you got a few questions for you, okay? So, if I'm reading your report correct, the pink jacket from Erica Casper Miles tested positive for gunshot residue. Is that right? That's 003A. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. What does it mean when you say, because of these results, not the very bottom of the report, Exhibit 6A was not fully processed, Exhibits 4A, 5A, and 7 were not processed? So for items of clothing that come from one person, once I have gunshot primer residue on one item of clothing, uh, there is no additional weight uh, scientifically that can be applied to finding it on other articles of clothing from the same person. So uh, for efficiency's sake, they would not be fully tested. Okay, and then on page two, you, you address exhibits for 53, 
through 56A, which are the essentially the close. Uh, it says shirt from Stephen Wiggins, jeans from Stephen Stephen Wiggins. Basically, the clothes worn by Stephen Wiggins. Yes, sir. And what was your finding as to those clothes? So for exhibits 53A, 54A, and 54B, which are the shirt, uh, jeans, and belts from Stephen Wiggins, I did not find the presence of gunshot from arresting particles. And then for exhibits 55A, B, and C, and 56A, which are the shoes, underwear, socks, and backpack from Stephen Wiggins, uh, those were not processed due to them either being covered or the amount of time and the conditions that they had been through before prior to coming into the lab. Okay. So that decision was made. You had information prior to you saying exhibit 55A, B, C, and 56A. There's no sense in even processing these because I know that based on time or condition that they can't even test. Right, that they, they results by them should not, should not be eliminated. Yeah. However, you did feel that 53A, 54A, 54B um, still warranted testing, correct? Uh, that's correct. Now, the first paragraph on this page talks about Exhibit 58A. Of course, that's what you, you talked about was the stubs. Uh, from the interior shower, they had tested positive. Then underneath that, it says, because of these results, additional samples were not completely processed as to exhibit, or in exhibit 57A, it was not processed, excuse me. So 57A was clothing for a rear seat of sack. So can you, can you explain to the jury why, why those clothes from the rear seat of Saturn weren't processed? So similarly to finding residues on one article of clothing and not testing the rest from the person. Uh, with 57A clothing that was in the vehicle, since I had identified gunshot final residues from within the vehicle, finding more residues in the vehicle would not have added any extra weight to the uh, conclusions. All right, and based on your area of expertise and the scope of that expertise, can you say whether or not a gun was fired from inside the vehicle, definitively? No. So with, uh, with my area of expertise and the analysis of gunshot primer residues, I can say that they were present, and that could have happened from a gun being fired in the vehicle, but it could also have happened from the surfaces coming in contact with a fired weapon. Uh, there are other ways that those could have gotten. Thank you. Me direct. There you are. Thank you, Agent. You may step down and you are released. You may call your next witness. Fair to say we call Agent Shelley Carbon. Um, career details. 
So how long have you been with TBI? Since 1994, so for 31 years. And so how long have you been uh, the supervisor? Since 2011, so um, 10 years. What's your educational background? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Belmont University in Nashville. I majored in chemistry and minored in biology. My training to be a farms examiner with an on-the-job training program at the TBI Crime Lab, and that lasted two years, and I followed the guidelines established by the Association of Firearm and Full Market Examiners. During that two-year training program, I did extensive background reading and research, prepared and presented papers on the topics that are important in the field of firearms identification, such as the history of the science of firearms she identification. She sounds like she's reading this. Um, the history and development of firearms and ammunition. Had the opportunity to tour firearm and ammunition manufacturing plants across the country to see firsthand how firearms are manufactured because it's during the manufacturing process that unique markings are left on the firearm, which make it possible to identify a bullet or a cartridge case that's being fired in that firearm. I disassembled, reassembled hundreds of firearms to see the different types of actions that you might encounter in firearms, also to learn the different safety features that might be there. During my training program, I also was trained to do tool mark analysis, where I compared any kind of tool to anything that it might um, come in contact with and leave a mark on. I was trained to restore serial numbers that had been obliterated. I also was trained in chemical testing of clothing to determine how far away from the front of the gun or the muzzle of the gun the person was when the gun was discharged. And I was trained and was on a crime scene team for 25 years where I documented and collected firearms evidence. In May of 2018, were you part of the VCRT? I was not. Okay, I've got the Rust so merch link. I think it's working now. I had to read, yeah, create everything. Now, we, you talked a little bit about your uh, training as far as uh, firearms and identification. Could you tell me a little bit more about your training and uh, what it takes to become an expert in tool marks? Tool marks is, the, is almost the umbrella that includes firearms identification. A tool, when it comes in contact with the surface and forces apply, can leave its markings on the softer um, surface of the um, that it's acting on. And the reason that does this is when tools are manufactured, different processes are used, and those tools that are making the actual tool itself are constantly undergoing random microscopic changes. They're wearing out a little bit sometimes molded metal sticks to the tools that are creating the tool surfaces. And all of those random microscopic changes to the surface of the tool that's being made will be transferred to um, the item that it acts on and marks. In this particular case, well, actually, we do this. You know, the state would tender Asian Carbon as an expert in firearms and tool work. Okay. Should we qualify as an expert in that field? Thank you, Your Honor. In this particular case, as it pertains to tool marks, did you collect any evidence yourself? I did. What did you collect? I collected the interior driver's side door handle from the Saturn and also a pair of pliers that were in the driver's floorboard of this same Saturn. May I approach this? You mind? Agent Carmen, if you'll actually, if you would, wouldn't mind first identifying what's in there and then opening the package. Okay, I can identify this. It has a laboratory number, um, the barcode stickers with my exhibit number and the description of the evidence. This is also the packaging that I collected the uh, flyers in. I, I did the labeling on it, and it has the evidence tape that I placed onto the packaging after I completed my analysis. Thank you. 
these I can identify the the flyers that I collected from the shatter and also examine because I have the laboratory number, the exhibit number assigned to these, and my initials. I'll hand you a photograph if you would see if you recognize this photograph. <coughs> I have seen this photograph. I did not take this photograph. Okay. Can you do you recognize what it is? Sir? It's a photograph of the Saturn, and you can see the pliers in the floorboard uh, beside the panel bottle. Is this the same photograph that you see up here on the screen? It is. Thank you. Now I'm going to move the photograph, that particular photograph, in as the next exhibit. One ninety four. Thank you. Do you recognize what's in that photograph? I do. And if you would, is that the same that's on the screen here? It is, and it's just a, a more close-up view of the same wires I'm about to paint the bottle. I'll ask if that can be the next exhibit, please. And the flyers that you just showed the jury, are those the same ones that are in these photographs? They are. That you can see they have the, the yellow on the inside of the handles and the black grip, and then they just look joined with the bent neck. I'm going to ask uh, that we make the pliers the next exhibit, but then Madam Clerk, if you'll hand that back to Ms. Carlin. Hold on just one second. Hello? Hello? I tried, guys. I tried, but just got a spam call, but it's gone. This is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, Agent Carmen, when you were doing these tests, were you aware of the significance of the, the fires in this case? I was aware that um, there was a statement made that fires were necessary to open the door of this app. You would identify on the packaging what that item is. And this would be the interior door handle from the Saturn um, that I collected from the Saturn. Again, I can identify it with my. Um, description of what, what it was, what was contained inside, and it has an laboratory number and the barcode with my stickers, my initials, and it includes those evidence tapes that I placed on it after I completed my analysis. If you would, uh, please open that and show the jury what that is. out the details of the manhunt on Twitter. Uh, we're, we're trying to find some... I'm watching the air traffic control. I'm watching a bunch of things. We're looking to see if we're going to take over viewing that. So just hold tight. I'm, keep, I'm keeping up to date on it. Agent, do you recognize that document? I do. What is that document? It is a copy of my official finance report that I generated on the, the completion of the testing on this case. Now, in this report, uh, did you find conclusions about the, the pliers and that interior door handle? I did have a result on the on the door handle compared to another pliers. Okay, so uh, on your report, is the uh, interior door handle in uh, Exhibit 143A on the lab report? It is. And then the pliers would then be 142A, is that correct? Yes. Mr. Edwards, if you go to the top of page three, please. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Agent Carmen, if you would uh, discuss with the jury the findings of your examination and how you arrived at those conclusions. Okay, the, the official findings on our report are examination of Exhibit 143A, which is the door handle, failed to reveal the presence of pull marks. No examination was performed on the flyers in Exhibit 142. And to come to that conclusion, I looked, I did a visual examination of the door handle. And what I was looking for are markings that I could use to compare to the fires. I didn't see anything visually when I first looked at it. So I looked at it under the um, under a microscope so that I had a magnified image to look at. And I didn't see, and there's some wear on these and, and maybe some scratches, but I didn't see an area with tool marks that I thought was sufficient to um, compare to test tool marks that I could have made from the fires. We have the lights turned back on. And Agent, I'm going to ask you if there's no objection that you would uh, show the jury so they can have a better visual of what that door handle looks like. If you mind walking it in front so they can see it, please. This is the door handle. And if you were standing in the driver's seat, you would see the door the manhunt yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the screen here just a second just one second Thank you, Agent. I want to turn our attention to the bulk of your report. Actually, if you would, wouldn't mind, we can get back to the uh, clerk when you're done, done doing things like that. The report or the, the, the other two exhibits? You could have been out of your way. Asia, let's turn our attention to uh, to firearm identification. That's a really broad term, I'm sure, to you. Just firearm identification, right? It is. So, if you would educate the jury and uh, and me, for that matter, on everything that you can test with firearms. Okay, this is the uh, this information about the manhunt. Would be to receive a firearm and any number of fire bullets and fire cartridge cases. For me to examine to determine whether those bullets and cartridge cases have been fired in that firearm. I might also have some ammunition submitted with the firearm. And um, my report is going to call any single unit of ammunition that's going to refer to that we'll, as we'll a talk about it in just a second. Here. That's an unfired round of ammunition. A lot of people call those bullets. Um, when I refer to bullets today, what I'll be talking about is the bullet that comes out of the barrel when the gun is fired. Um, but typically, I receive a firearm bullets and cartridge cases for comparison. The first thing I do is I examine the firearm. I document it with photographs. I write down everything that the make, the model, the serial number, the caliber, anything that's unusual about it, what kinds of safeties it has what kind of action it has, I take measurements, and I perform a trigger pull analysis. I make sure that that firearm is safe for me to fire, and then I fire test fires into a bullet recovery tank, and that's just the big water tanks. I recover the fire bullets um, from the water tank, and the water will stop the bullets without imparting any markings onto the bullets. I recover the fire bullets and the fire cartridge cases that I fired in that firearm. Those are going to be my known standards that I will look at. And when I look at those under a comparison microscope, I can see two bullets or two cartridge cases side by side through one eye piece. So I can see the markings that are left during the firing process on those fire bullets and fire cartridge cases. Once I, I have identified what types of markings that firearm leaves, then I'll look at the evidence bullets and cartridge cases and see if they have those same markings. If they do, then I can conclude that those bullets and cartridge cases have been fired in that firearm. If they don't have the same markings, I might have an, an elimination, or I might have an in between an elimination and identification is a range of inconclusives. 
Thank you. So these flights that you compared to, the, the rounds that you have fired into the water tank and that you then compare, are those then compared to items collected from crime scenes? Yes. Madam Clerk, if I can see exhibits 89 and 160, please. Juror question. So I'm slowly adding people back to the uh, yeah, Asian view, the, the, the editing ability. Just to you. Do you recognize that? <laughs> I do. Again, it has the laboratory number, the barcode stickers with my visit number, my initials, and the evidence taken up based on it and initialed after I completed my analysis. Can you tell what that uh, piece of evidence is? I can. It is my exhibit 48A, which is the fire bullet from the right arm of Ben Baker. Thank you. Now, exhibit 160 there in the white box, do you recognize that item? I do. Again, it has the laboratory number, the barcode with the exhibit numbers, um, my initials, and evidence tape that I placed on it after my analysis. Now, Agent, if you would, let's take the, the item that's within the white box out. And as you're, we'll make sure it's safe and clear. There's a cable tie in the action of the pistol that I placed in it after I completed my analysis, but I have made a visual examination, felt in the barrel and also on the magazine well, and it's there. Thank you. Now, I guess the simple question is, how can you tell that the bullet in Exhibit 89 was fired from the gun, the high point uh, handgun in Exhibit 160? Okay, I did the same process with this firearm when it was submitted to me. I determined that as a high point model JHP 45 auto caliber pistol, and the serial number on it is X4308934. It was in normal, well, it was in operating condition. The trigger pull on this was a little bit gritty, and the barrel was rusted when I received it, um, but it was in operating condition. I test fired it. Um, and I looked at the test fire bullet versus the bullet from his arm. When I first received this though, um, like I said, the, the barrel was rusted upon receipt and I attempted to clean the barrel as much as I could. I don't know if it's still, we well, can't tell now that it was rusted, but it was completely full of rust um, on the edges, on the rims of the barrel. I cleaned that the best I could and then I shot my test fire. When I looked at those bullets under the microscope, I could see an excessive amount of striations on the very surface of the bullet. So I knew that the um, rust had caused some damage to the barrel. That's not what bullets typically look like when they're fired through a barrel. Um, these were covered with striations that were um, larger than we normally see and just covered. They just covered the surface of the bullet. So they should cover the striations. And there's scratches that are placed on the bullet as the bullet travels through the barrel. And if there's an imperfection in the barrel, um, if it's a, a dot or a raised area, when the bullet travels down the barrel, um, because the bullet's moving, that's gonna show up as a scratch on the side of the bullet. Um, that's a striation. So that's what I look at. Typically bullets have um, most of the striations on the base of the bullet when they're fired. The bullets that I test fired and this were all along the sides of the bullet. So there are a lot more striations along deeper, um, grosser striations that I typically see um, on bullets that I've in barrel. And so in this particular uh, case with uh, your lab exhibit 48A and exhibit 50A, what conclusions were you able to come to? The bullet from Daniel Baker had the same class characteristics 
as this pistol. And what I mean by class characteristics, that's the number of grooves that are cut into the barrel during the manufacturing process, and those grooves are cut in a spiral motion so that as the bullet travels down the barrel, it's going to pick up that spin, and when the bullet exits the barrel, it's going to be spinning um, in flight. That's going to give stability and um, accuracy to the bullet as it travels down range. This manufacturer cut seven grooves into this barrel with a left hand twist. That's pretty uncommon for um, 45 all caliber firearms. When I ran this through the database, this was the only type of firearm that came up with those rifling characteristics. Those are the same rifling characteristics that I found on this bullet, but the individual characteristics those that result from the manufacturing process, those that might have been obscured from the rust in this barrel um, didn't match. But the, the seven grooves with the left hand twist, which is what's in this firearm, those were the same. Why is that? Why the difference that you're talking about there? I believe it was the condition of the barrel, the rust in the barrel. <coughs> no. It could have been from a different gun, but... <coughs> The condition of the barrel um, was very, very rusted. The bullets that I fired through it were obviously not fired through a first thing barrel. So it could have been a different gun. It could also have been the condition of the barrel. Okay. Now, let's go through your uh, report that you have here. The question I have is the, the bullets you use for the test fire. The, the, the rounds that used for the test firing, where did those come from? Uh, the reference collection that I have at the laboratory. Right. Now, we've previously uh, entered several exhibits that are cartridge cases that were found uh, at, I guess, on the outdoors on the road at uh, Tidwell Switch and San Vinny Road, as well as uh, cartridges that were found within the Saturn, specifically. Exhibits 9A, 10A, 25A, 26A, and then 60 through 63A and 66A. Did you or were you able to make any comparisons uh, of those particular cartridges with anything that you knew in this case? Some of those ex exhibits are cartridge cases, and I also had um, some unfired cartridges. I had four from a hotel room and I also had, I believe, one from the Saturn. And the seven fired cartridge cases that I had that had been fired, I also had one cartridge case that was separated from the bullet that had not been fired. The bullet that I had from Daniel Baker and an unfired bullet from the Saturn, they were all consistent with um, laser brand 45 auto caliber ammunition. Okay. That answers your question, but yes. Now we're able to compare. I guess well, let's do this. Let's look at the, um, the your fourth pa the paragraph of your results. The, the fired laser brand forty five auto cartridge cases. If you would go through and explain to the jury what your findings are here. Okay, I had seven fired 45 auto caliber cartridge cases from this scene. Four were at the Tidwell Switch Sand Vineyard Road area, and three were out of the Saturn. All seven of those cartridge cases had been fired in this high point pistol that was submitted on this case. And how were you able to sell that? Again, I looked at the Test fire cartridge cases that I personally fired in this pistol, determine what markings are left by that pistol, and look for those markings on the evidence cartridge cases. Those markings were the same, so I could conclude that those cartridge cases had been fired in this pistol. And specifically, what sort of markings are you looking at? I'm looking at um, markings on the breech face of the pistol, and that's the area that supports the head of the cartridge when the cartridge is fired. And it is um, the backward portion right here. This is the ejection port. The brute trace, I, I know that you can't see it from here, but it's, it's this part right up here. The firing pin comes through that, and it's the firing pin hitting the primer of the cartridge that causes the detonation of the cartridge under the fire. 
So I look at the great trace area, the fire pen, which causes the ignition of the cartridge, um, and also the extractor and injector. On this side, the fire pen acts as the ejector, so I didn't have that, but the extractor markings. All of those um, match this pistol. So those cartridge traces were firing this pistol. Now, we've already discussed the findings you have in the fifth paragraph on page two of your report, but I don't think one thing I didn't ask um, was the uh, your exhibit, lab exhibit 48A, which is the trial exhibit 89, was it a 45 caliber bullet? It was. It's a 45 auto caliber bullet, um, the same type of design as was loaded in the unfired cartridges from the hotel room and from the Saturn. And also consistent with what would have been loaded in those cartridge cases that were fired. If you would, as you go through the remainder uh, of your report as it pertains to the firearms and the cartridges. I also had two other pistols submitted on this page. They were both block service weapons from Daniel Baker. Those were found to be in normal operating condition. One was a nine millimeter caliber block pistol. Model 17, and the other was a 357 SIG caliber block pistol, Model 33. Um, so they both functioned. They were not linked to any of the evidence in this case, any of the fired evidence in this case. And I entered um, the <coughs> The Glock 357 SIG caliber pistol was recovered in the backpack with the high point pistol from Stephen Wiggins. And because that was not in possession of the, of the deputy or it was in an unknown location for several days, I entered test fire cartridge cases from that Glock pistol and from this high point pistol into our live and database. And that's basically just a database of cartridge cases from crime scenes and also cartridge cases that are test fired in recovered firearms to see if either one of those linked to any other crimes. And they did not. Thank you. Now, I do want to talk about uh, handgun barrels in, in general a little bit here. Are there different quality of manufacturers out there? There is. And what would you consider kind of the top of the cream of the crop? type of barrel based on what you do for a living? Well, they're going to be your higher cost of firearms. They're going to have the best manufacturing processes and the best coatings on the barrel that are going to last the longest, that are going to be your best shooting guns. Um, so your HEKs, your SIGs, your more expensive firearms. Now the coatings, what, what do you mean by coatings? Well, it can also be the types of metals that are used in the barrel making process. Some barrels don't rust as quickly as others. Um, this firearm seems to rust rather quickly. I get guns a lot of times from the side of the road or that have been found in the field. And those barrels aren't in the same kind of condition as, as this was. And they could have been there for months or years. Um, this one was extremely rusted for the amount of time between the shooting scene and the collection of this pistol. Based on your understanding of the case, how much time had passed from the time of the shooting until um, it was recovered or uh, taken into evidence by Asian Gooch? A, a day or two. I'm not sure of the exact same time. And so in this particular case, the, the, the rust that's in this barrel, is it a function of quality? Or, what are, what are we talking about? It could be a function of quality. I actually called the manufacturer on that because it was unusual. And I talked to the owner of the of Hot Point, and he said that they didn't really put a coating on the inside of the barrel to prevent it from rusting. He wasn't that surprised that it happened that quickly. Um, so that's he, he was he gave me. Not that surprised? He wasn't that surprised that it happened. The, the gist of this testimony is that High Point makes They're very cheap firearms. Uh, for that. And they do come with oil in the barrel, but even the manufacturer recommends that you clean the oil out before you shoot it. And so I guess the, the bottom line is, due to the quality of that particular barrel, it then had an extreme amount of rust compared to what you would normally see? 
it did have a determined amount of rust compared to what I normally see, and um, it probably was due to the steel alloy that they used to make steel. Thank you. One moment, Your Honor. Pass away, Your Honor. Mr. Evans. Thank you, okay, we're gonna we're gonna pause just for a minute, guys, because there's starts Good to be a little bit of action now. There. There's a little bit of action in the uh attention three quarter line alpha size. Okay, hang on. We've got a couple things going on up in up in Idaho. Engine eleven will be making fire attack with the engine three quarter line on the alpha side. What what you're hearing right there is actually not um is is not the the manhunt, but we we did just get a call come in. Um, the manhunt that we're we're talking about. Let me see if I can show you this. Let's go to this one here. Okay, uh, quickly on this manhunt. Uh, the uh, the story on this the Skylar W. Mead. He went uh, missing. He he had a, a he got in like a fight. He's been in jail since 2016 uh, for a, a cup a couple things, um, including um, assault on an officer. Um, Grand Theft Auto. Let's see. Yeah, it was a black Audi two-door Malad westbound on Vista. He's probably doing 60 now. I'm uh, not pursuing maybe upwards of 80 uh, coming up to uh, Tarvi if someone's in the area. I know plates on a temporary back window. Okay, so they're trying to stop a Lexus with no plates. All right. Um, let, let me tell you this really quickly just to keep you guys updated on what's happening in Idaho. Here. Uh, not not a ton, not a ton of information on this one, but uh, and I'm getting some of this from Crime Online, who put this together from some of the other reports that are coming out immediately. This was this afternoon. This happened. You've got three uh, Idaho corrections. Okay, you've got three Idaho corrections officers who were injured in a in a shooting. What? Okay. I've got I've got two scanners going. So. Um, Okay, that's that's all of that one. Okay, what we have, we've got three uh, corrections officers that were injured, and the story is a little wild, it's a little crazy. The this inmate gets injured and is taken to a hospital, and the, and they took him to a hospital called um, Saint Alphonsus. Well, there's like 17 Saint Alphonsus uh, hospitals in Boise, so I'm not sure which one they they took him to. But they uh, they take him to the hospital and as they're taken to the hospital someone at the hospital opens fire on the police officers okay like this was a setup uh two officers are are shot uh there no, no none of them have passed away but uh let's see they uh they were shot early wednesday the suspect shot two idoc officers the third officer was shot by a boise police officer who mistook them for an armed suspect near the hospital's entrance so boise police responds thinks that it's a suspect it's actually another police officer he shoots him that police officer is in critical condition but stable um so the third injury was actually a a, a friendly fire situation with a, a non-identity uh, Mead and the suspect allegedly fled in a gray four-door sedan before boise police arrived at the hospital he had been jailed since 2016 on aggra aggravated battery, a law enforcement officer with a firearm enhancement. He also had prior convictions for possession of a controlled substance, grand theft, and introduction of contraband into a correctional facility. Um, this uh, from Crime Online uh, also says that KTVB uh, reported that he received a 20-year sentence for shooting at a Twin Falls police sergeant during a high-speed chase. He was scheduled to be released in 2036. Uh, now he's that's probably going to be pushed out if we can get a hold of him again. Anyway, so they've got this. Uh, they've got this uh, flyer out. As and let me see if I can show you um, on flight radar. I'm doing a little uh, little searching here to try to see if we can find a planes for you and see what's going on. But uh, Boise area looks like this. This is this is a beauty. Hang on. We've got some traffic going in still. Here's Boise, right? And and there's like a million hospitals. Look, look at all these St. Alphonsus uh, right here. Um, let's see. I can't I can't see how they're doing training drills as well with fire, which makes it no. Well, that's uh, air. Let's see. Sycamore, Southwest Dental. Got to find them here. 
cemeteries. Boise's a big place. Boise's, Boise's big. And look, yes, it does have these, these blocks and these grids. Look at these roads. Uh, it, it does look like a you know, lined paper, you know, like, like graph paper. That's the, the overlaying map uh, uses a grid system uh, in Boise, but then the, the roads within that sort of deviate quite a bit. But just looking at uh, what's up in the air in the area, uh, they've got a couple airports. Uh, these are these little uh, R-22s, um, Robinsons. They're, they're just for a training. But I'm not seeing anything in the air as far as police doing any sort of pattern searches. So th that would indicate that they'd have no idea where this guy is, that he's, uh, that he's missing entirely. Uh, let's see, Homedale. This is a tiny plane. That's, uh, that little Cessna is not going to be a, uh, a police plane. This guy here, no. So by now he's he's probably going to split one of two directions. So if we look at this, if you if you zoom out on on Boise, there's basically you can go north or south, right? If you go south down through Mountain Home, uh, you can you can get down to Twin Falls, and you can either go across back up towards uh, you know like Yellowstone up here, or you can go back down to Utah. Um, there, very few people go down to Nevada this way, but you can get down there that way as well. Um, or you can head up north and you, you cut across into uh, you know the Pacific Northwest, if you get far enough, uh, across into the Oregon, uh, Washington area. Um, so north, south, east, west, uh, it could be anywhere. If he heads to the mountains, this is some of the most rugged area you've ever seen uh, next to next to Idaho, you know, in Idaho here. This, this is beautiful, beautiful country, very rugged. Uh, you're going to get lost. It's not the sort of thing you just go hiking in for fun. But so, and, the, and Boise is like right at the edge of that. The, I mean, Boise is like literally right at the foot of the mountains, and then it just gets steeper and steeper. So, uh, that's the update. I'm going to keep listening to this as we as we uh, as we go on. There's there's not a lot happening scanner wise. Um, there, so there's no there's no like organized search on the ground. The police aren't out there, you know, beating the bushes. Uh, the last information we had, which we, I showed you right here, was that he was seen in this gray Honda Civic. Um, it's got a tattoo on the left eye. It's a one the tattoo on the right eye. It's an eleven. Um, let's see. He's uh, age. Don't know. Male. White. Height. Don't know. Weight. Don't know. Hair color is bald. Eye color. Don't know. Um, we're hoping for some updates. That that's the suspect. That's the unknown suspect. That's the person who most likely was shooting at the police officer. Uh, the Skyler. The Skyler guy. The inmate himself. He's got quite a few distinctive tattoos. Um, there's also some images out there if you search. I don't want to show them because they're quite a bit of blood, but it looks like he got in a fight at the prison that would have sent him here, and so he's got some cuts to his face and some blood on his torso and stuff, pictures that were taken at the hospital before, you know, or probably at the jail before the breakout. Um, last contact was today. He's age 31. He's a male, white, 5 foot 6 inches tall, 150 pounds, so he's a, he's a skinny guy. Uh Hair color is brown, but it's shaved. Uh, hazel eyes. Last seen wearing shorts and no shirt. He has a tattoo on the right arm. D tattoo on the left leg. Star tattoo under the left eye. A teardrop tattoo under the chest. On the chest, a clown or a skull. Um, face product of my uh, my enforcement covers the entire chest area. Product of my enforcement. Oh my goodness. Uh, tattoo on the stomach. He has AK across his stomach. So. Uh, uh, if this guy's got his shirt off, he's going to be pretty recognizable. So I would say look for a couple things. Look for the car, they, the, the gray Honda Civic that they made made way, I mean, they got away in. And then also look for um, <laughs> look for missing shirts because this guy needs to cover up if he wants to get anywhere. Idaho police is issuing a blue alert on behalf of Boise PD for an individual they believe is an imminent and credible threat to law enforcement and or the public. The individuals are considered armed and dangerous. Please do not approach but call 911 or 208 377 6790 for tips. Um, this is out of Ada County, which is where Boise is located. It's the capital city of Idaho. And, uh, and for more information, if you're on Twitter, I would follow ISP underscore alerts on Twitter as they have released this information. They do all the missing people stuff. It's the official uh, state police uh, Twitter feed. But uh, is public on lockdown? No, uh, no lockdowns that we're, we've heard. It's just it's just a heightened sense of awareness. We they, I think they think that he's trying to get away. 
obviously a, a prison inmate escaped. He had an accomplice. Uh, this is not the same as the Cavalcante case where, where he got away and was on foot and was, was basically stuck and, and limited with where he could go. He was hiding from everybody. Here he has an, a, a friendly who's helping him, uh, who did the, the shooting, initial shooting, we believe, uh, that enabled him to escape. And, and so he's, uh, he's, he's with this individual, and they're probably making a run for it. It's terrible for Boise. It is. Boise is a beautiful place. Great people up there. Um, amazing river, the parade, all that fun stuff. No lockdown because they, they don't have location. I mean, they don't, if, if he was on foot, if he was on foot and he was, he was running somewhere and hang on, listen to the scanner as well, out of one ear. If he was on foot and he was headed a certain direction, they would, in, in instant, they would instantly they would go to the schools. They would put those on lockdown in the area and things like that. But where he's on in a vehicle, Idaho, it has a major thoroughfare right down the middle of it. Uh, and it's just, it, it's north or south. You can go north or south, and it's sort of like north, northwest or southeast uh, to get out of Idaho. But there's a lot of space around Idaho. Uh, if you've never been out west and, and driven on some of the roads, you can drive for quite a while and not see anything. And I mean anything. It's, it's, a, it's flat. It's barren. The, some areas just are like tumbleweeds and, and wind. Um, so this is the type of, uh, this is the type of, type of thing that, uh, he, time is, is not on his side if he's getting away because it's easy to monitor the main thoroughfares in and out. Now there are a million other places you can go and a million places you could lay low. I mean, if you, if you wanted to, to get, uh, you know, to, you could get to the snake river and, and you could, uh, you know, take a boat and, and see if you could get out that way. Uh, that was, I mean, this is, this is not uh, too far as far as, actually, let me see if I can show you this. Let's see if we've got, do we have Google Earth over here? Okay. Google Earth is on the other one. Just one second here. They're doing a training with the fire department right now, and, and I don't want to confuse people because some of the, the traffic from the fire department um, on the scanner is, um, it sounds real, and it sounds like there's you know all sorts of drama because they're literally, they're role-playing a scenario with a fire department that uh, that could be very serious. But having heard that this is, there's a training going on, I know that those calls are not actual events with the fire and you know trapped people and things like that, so I don't want to put that out on the air and have people... Um, get the wrong idea um, because it's it's not okay so let's uh, let's bring this over here where's where are we oh let's let's pull this over here we go ready set you guys want to take a, a view a trip around the world here we go today only we'll do a special special trip here we go you can see this. All right, so here we are in in Idaho. If you if we zoom out a little bit, we're on Earth. We'll start there. We're going to zoom into Idaho and Boise is this white dot. That's the capital city right there. This is the location where he was uh, went missing out of. And there are hospitals all over in this area. I mean, it's a little skewed. Hang on. There we go. There are hospitals all over. But if if you zoom out just a little bit, okay, you've got this I eighty four. Headed down south, it goes down through like mountain home and everything. All these little circles. This is just farmland. This is farmland, and it's flat. It's flat. It's farmland, um, but lots of farms and, and nothing. And then it cuts across the state here through this like uh, this area across through Burley, um, Jerome area, uh, and then you can either split down I eighty four meets up with I fifteen, which is the major thoroughfare that runs all the way down through Utah and down towards Las Vegas. Um, so that's that's a, one of the big routes into and out of. Of Boise, and then if you go up to the north, you can see that same road. I eighty four sort of passes through Boise, winds along the river there, and then heads up. Uh, and you can either go up through Wiser and up th into the mountainous area there, or you can sort of head left and go over um, a little bit further. Let's see where is I was going to show you where BK was, and I can't even remember the name of his city for some reason. Where was he at? Um, BK was up here, Moscow. There we go. Moscow's right here. Moscow, Idaho, up north, okay? So by comparison, way down here on the other side of these mountains. Um, 
Hang on, we've got another call coming in. It'll be a little bit. It'll be a little bit before we hear this. So distance-wise, long a long, long way from Moscow up here. Let's see if I can measure. Let's. Uh, where's my measuring tool? I think it's this one. So from Moscow to Boise. Copy. Why does it not tell me what it measures? Got another call coming in right here. Just one second. Four six five seven South Eagle, cross the Mount Etna. Copy in route. Team, was that you showing in route? Copper. Copy showing route. The suspect vehicle is going to be a GMC dually, dark colored. Possibly the driver got out and went inside the store. Okay, that's a different suspect. That's not our same one. That's a that's a dually. Uh, let me delete this one more time. Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to remeasure the distance between Moscow and Boise for all of you. you probably have, have already Googled it to know the distance, but let's see. We've got, we've got Moscow right here and Boise right here. It was on my other screen. So uh, that is 217 miles as the crow flies. Obviously, it's going to be about 250 if you have to take the roads there and around. Uh, so we'll clear that one off over here. All righty. Uh, anyway, this is it. That's it. As the crow flies. Four at Eagle. A Do I mean Coleman? Pulling an SUV on a trailer, cutting vehicles off, and being reckless. Um, if you look right here, uh, Pullman is just across the border. So Pullman is right here. That's where BK lived, but he went to school. Or, or the murders were committed in Moscow. Uh, and so when we when we start following this trial, uh, I could. I think we can show you exactly where he lived. Let's see. He was around here. Copy. He was on in some dorm apartments, I believe, that were right in this Four. area. Alarm company is advising a false alarm. You can cancel. False alarm. Four copies cancel available. He was right here near <laughs> campus, I think, uh, and and he could either come out because so his, his trip out. Uh, from from Pullman, either took him down here to this uh, this big road, and down or up and around this little field, this little oval. And either way, he took the then the straightaway across across the state lines over here into into Idaho and down into Moscow, which happens right down here. And and then uh, of course on his on his run, he he headed south all the way down to the river, which was. Let's see. I've got to see where the river was. I think the river was way like down here, all the way down to the Snake, the Snake River down here. He went this far. So, anyway, uh, Snake River is huge. By the way, it goes through all over. It's all over in in Idaho. <laughs> it's massive. All right. That uh, is that. Any any other questions you have that I can answer about this? And then we go back to trial here. Now let's visit other people's houses and chat. Vicky, we could do that. There's a large enclave in northern Idaho with this of his type of people that would likely help him out. He might be headed there. Uh, they northern Idaho is sort of known for what they call they refer to as skinheads. Um, they're they're typically uh, peop, individuals that have I, I don't know how do I say this his his appearance. If you look at if you look at his. Um, his his sheet there, the shaved head and the tattoo. Uh, that that is like the the look of of some of the groups that are up there. They tend to be anti government. They tend to be anti social, uh, and tend to be violent. And so there's there's a fair representation of them up there. Some of them are also um, sort of into a lot of the the German, um, Nazi uh, type stuff. Um, but 
yeah. Anyway, we don't have any indication uh, from his from his tattoos. It doesn't show anything that would lean that way or the or other. He just has a shaved head and a lot of tattoos. Uh, Kathy says, "I'm right by that white dot. Uh, be careful, Kathy. Please." Uh, I don't think skins heads is a politically correct. It's not um, white supremacist. I not. I yeah. I don't know. I don't know. There, there are so many correct words to say something. Both, I would say both of them are wrong, in my opinion. Um, whether, whether you're a, a violent individual who's violent for no reason or somebody who believes that one race is better than the other, I think both of you are wrong. <laughs> that's, just, that's just my opinion. Okay. Anyway, so that's your update. We're going to go back to court and watch the rest of this trial, if that's all right, or we can stay here and, and watch. You know, nothing happen on, on, on flight radar. Let's see, I don't see. I'm clear. I don't remember if I told you that or not. You didn't tell us. Six four seven fifteen twenty four. Where's flight radar? I lost flight radar. Okay. All right. Let's go back to court and finish up today. Um, just wanted to give you the update. Uh, ready to, here we go. Yes. I just got a few questions. So uh, you talk about this rust that you found in the barrel of the high point. Okay? Um, you don't know how long that rust has been there. You can't really speak to that, I would imagine. No, no, I don't know how long it's been there. And just to be clear, you test fired the Glock 357, correct? I did. And when you say it's in normal operating condition, does that mean if you put a, a round, a live round in it, and, uh, pull the trigger, it'll, it'll uh, send a bullet out the end of the barrel? It will. Okay. Uh, same thing for the high point, regardless of the rust or not having rust. Was it in an operating condition such that if you put a live round in it, pull the trigger, a bullet's going to come out the end of the barrel? It, it is. All right. Thank you. Father, Your Honor, uh, ask that the firearms report from Agent Carmen be, Carmen be made. Mark that as the next exhibit. Um, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, I need to um, take up one matter outside of your presence. If you will just pass over to the jury room for a moment, we'll hopefully be very quick. Did you hear what I just heard? I just heard that they are yeeting the jury out of the courtroom for the fifth time. Is that 198? Yes, sir. <laughs> that is pretty good. The jurors, I've had three different questions submitted by the jurors, all of which are relating to the same issues. So I thought I would, the first one I was, Ms. Handed says, can we conclude that the driver's side door handle of the Saturn was operational and did not need the pliers to help open the door? Then I was handed one that says, did you try to open the door with the inner handle before removing the handle from the vehicle? And the third one was the handle of the Saturn altered prior to technician's removal was the cable or rod connected are hanging out of the door panel. So all we have three jurors who all had the same idea. So Mr. Wyatt, do you want to ask the questions of this witness and see what the response is? And if there's any objection, I'll be glad to consider it. Yeah, sure. Agent Carmen, uh, did you open and close the Saturn door? I didn't set in the seat of the Saturn and open and close the door, but I did um, pull the, the latch. <laughs> and um, I guess with that, the door handle was uh, intact when you took it apart, correct? It was. Thank you. What do I do with this? <laughs> okay. This, this next question, I think that will resolve that question. Mr. Evans, do you have anything to ask me about this witness or about those questions regarding the door handle? If, if your honor is going to ask when the jury comes back in, I may have some follow-up questions. Right. What I will do is I will ask 
<clears throat> this witness when we come back as to whether or not you know you tried to handle and where and let you explain how you tried to handle and was it in your opinion in operational condition was it as far as you know in operational condition the interior door latch as far as i know we did have an agent that tested that because someone did test it yes it was, were you present when it was tested i was uh, and was he sitting inside the vehicle yes and did he open the door using the handle? Yes. So yeah, we'll have an exhibit tomorrow to that effect through Asian Weeks. All right. Would you prefer then to have that issue resolved by that agent rather than have this? She can answer what she observed. I think she can answer what she observed, certainly. And we'll do that. Lastly, I've just been handed another uh, question from the jurors. <clears throat> Any rust on the bullet found in um, Sergeant, what I call him Daniel, but it's Sergeant Baker's arm? that you would not have analyzed the bullet from, that was removed from Sergeant Baker's arm during an autopsy, would you? I did examine the bullet, but not for, I didn't know that you pressed on that. And just for my own edification, is this rust that you found in this high standard, it's my understanding that difference in quality of the barrels can make, an idea, make a difference regarding how quickly a barrel could rust, but if the, if the barrel was submerged in water, for some period of time and then taken out that have accelerated if it had been submerged in water for some period of time and then taken out of the water would that have accelerated the rusting process? Yeah, that would have initiated an accelerated problem. Okay. All right, then if this is all we have left, then assuming that we can uh, go ahead and is this our last witness for the day? All right, then we'll go ahead and bring the jury in and I'll ask her those questions and we'll go from there. Bring the jury. I can't quite say it like he does, but uh, we will bring the jury. Lots of rust talk. I did get the rust uh, merchandise back in, up on the, on the screen. It should be available on, on the merch page if you search for it. For the record, is there any objection for me asking those questions since they were jury questions? No objections. Jury's coming back from the little jury's room. Is our Discord link uh, not working? Can somebody uh, on the Discord side help us with that? I say R, it's not mine, <laughs> but we like you. Oh, okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have had some questions submitted that three of which are basically all related to the operational condition of the door handle on the interior of the uh, Saturn vehicle. So I'm going to ask those questions in this witness. Uh, Agent, if you could, um, was there an examination of that handle of the interior of driver's side door of the Saturn before it was removed? There was. And do you know whether or not that, did you personally try the handle? I, I tried the handle. Uh, I didn't sit down into the, in the vehicle and close the door and then try to open it. What I did was I just, when the door was open, I checked the tension to make sure that it was connected. The, to your knowledge, was uh, there a test made of the interior door handle by anyone in your observation that would have indicated whether it was in working condition? Yes. 
There was. And can you tell us who did that and what you observed? It was um, Special Agent Brad Holt actually had put on a, a clean suit to get in the vehicle, and I believe it was video recorded by Agent Nice um, at the time that he was doing it, and he was able to get into the car, open the door, close it, open the door again, close it. I believe he locked it and unlocked it a couple of times also. <laughs> it was video, so. All right. And it's my understanding that that agent maybe that evidence may be coming through another agent, but did you personally observe that test? I was there during that test. Lastly, there was a question asked about uh, you testified about the rust in the barrel of that of that firearm. Do you did you make any examination of the bullet that was removed from Sergeant Baker's arm? On any bullet that comes in, I, I do the same type of exam. I document. Um, the weight of the bullet, the diameter of the bullet, the lands and grooves, or the, the rifling characteristics that are present on the bullet. Also look for any contamination that I can see. On that bullet, I did not observe any contamination. So that would probably be um, where if rust had been present on the bullet, I would have seen that. Now, it's a white, ladies like and a gentlemen, those questions were submitted by the jurors. Not my uh, discuss them outside of your presence with both sides, and there was no objection to it's me like answering, asking those questions. But please understand, those questions are simply being asked because one of the jurors, one of you, had requested that the question be asked. Do not infer that I have any interest in, in that answer or that I thought that was something that should have been asked at any point. My, my asking those questions was simply because a juror had requested them and it was just agreed that it would be simpler for me to ask them than one of the lawyers. Now, not a hazmat, I have some not that heavy. Good news and some bad news. Which one you want first? Uh, the bad, bad news bad is news first. that this is our last witness, and thank you, Agent. You can step down when we're finished with you. This is our last witness for the day. The good news is that the state tells me they think they can conclude their proof tomorrow. Now, uh, don't get too excited because there are several stages that will go beyond that, so it doesn't mean we're going to be quickly finish, we still have several things that we have to do. So, but it, uh, I think we are under the impression that perhaps late tomorrow afternoon, the state may be able to rest their proof. We will have several things that we'll have to still go through. So um, bear with us, but we'll, we've moved quickly through it. So um, I would appreciate your uh, indulgence a little longer. And I would just remind you of my admonition and my instructions to please do not discuss this case with anyone or let anyone discuss it with you. We've indicated to you before that um, just out of a precaution, I think we're going to have all your meals provided for you in either this location or at Montgomery Bell or some uh, place that we can ensure that you are insulated from any outside contact. So as uncomfortable as that may be in some situations, hopefully we'll be able to get you uh, fed and, and comfortable as, as quickly as possible. So we are finished then with the jury for the day. Is that correct, gentlemen? And ladies, all right, then ladies and gentlemen, you may retire to the jury room, and we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank, Thank you. All right, so that, that finishes up day two of the trial. These last two CVs were not made exhibits. Is that correct? Sorry, I thought I did. Yes, we asked to be made exhibits. All right, we will make them as exhibits as, uh, go ahead. I don't think there's any question. We qualify them as experts, but we'll go ahead and mark them. The next two exhibits in order, which would be 199, will be which one? Gun. CV of Cal Osborne. We actually, we've been keeping a log, and we had CV of Cal Osborne marked as 187, and the CV of Kelly Biden marked as 189. Mm. Hmm. One eighty seven brown evidence bag that contains the blood box of the Saturn. I don't know why it's not working. Rather than I've got to help to point, let's, let's go ahead and have you coordinate with our clerk. You and one of the defense team come coordinate with our clerk and let's make sure everybody's on the same page about what's exhibits. There's no problem with making these CVs a late file exhibit because all of these witnesses were qualified as experts and this is just a record keeping situation. So, all right. And if you will just take care of that when we adjourn, that would be my preference. All right. So tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, we'll resume and that's with our uh, emergency room doctors. Is that what we expect or do you have some other thought?
and then tomorrow, have we been able to speak with the judge and the other, or has there been any problem with coordinating the medical exam? Your Honor, I spoke with the judge, and uh, he let me know that the case in Warren County had settled. All right, so we're, we don't have a problem with Dr. Lee, then? I spoke with Dr. Lee, and I can know that Wednesday asked me a problem. What time are we expecting to have him here? Your Honor, he has to work in the, the lab in the morning. I told him in the afternoon that that will All right. We will look forward to that. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we will adjourn court at this time. All right. So as they, they have adjourned court, uh, just doing a quick check. Sometime this morning is when this guy broke out of um, custody um, by this guy. We're talking about um, the gentleman who's, whose head has been shaved. I have to be careful how I said this. I said that wrong initially. I said that incorrectly. So... This guy right here, uh, his head was shaved sometime this morning. It would only take about four hours to get to, um, the, you know, four or so hours to get from Boise to the Salt Lake area, which is um, a, a big thoroughfare to go either either west to to like Reno, um, south to Las Vegas. Um, there's it's a huge population center. Also, you can go east. You can go up to Evanston, Wyoming, uh, from just north of there. You can also head down south through Moab over into Colorado. Um, it's a lot of different ways they can go. Uh, about the same amount of time. I mean, think how far you could you could travel. It's very likely if he is is just on the run and going, like not stopping, uh, that he is well out of Idaho at this point. Now testifying, no one. I'm going to pin this one. <laughs> no. So possible that he's outside of Idaho if he's just on the run. If he's if he's headed towards Mexico, it's probably going to be down through Las Vegas. That would have been through Utah. He would still be in Utah about right now, I think, just now passing into maybe Las Vegas because you figure on the run you can't you can't speed right. You've got to fly under the radar and yeah, it's freaking Idaho gone wild lately. It's they've had some crazy stuff. Uh, these are suspects. Uh, these individuals, the, the one on the top was in custody. He's been in, you know, convicted in custody since 2016, broke out from a visit to the hospital when the two corrections officers who were escorting him to the hospital to get treatment from the injuries he received in a fight were fired upon by a, a second person who's the unknown suspect. Um, those officers were both hit. The suspect escaped. Um, and, and they escaped with that unknown suspect who did the shooting. So it sounds like that was a, a setup. Uh, then uh, in, in the search, the police responded. And in the search, one, of the, one um, officer or corrections officer, a, a, a third person, third officer, was shot by another officer, um, thinking that they, the armed person they were seeing coming in the door was, was a suspect. And, and no, it was another police officer. So we have three injured individuals. No one has passed away at this point, but the third in individual, the one who was shot by another officer, is the most severely injured from what we hear. So, so now we're, uh, we're on the lookout. So look out for a gray Honda Civic. Good thing it's not a, uh, a common car, right? Uh, plenty of gray Honda Civics out there. But um, that being said, hopefully, hopefully that gets a, a quick resolution and he gets uh, captured very quickly. Let's see, let's see, we've got a few others. All right, um, in the market for a new car, no clue what I want. I would, I would get one, first of all, that's comfortable, especially if you're going to spend a sizable amount of time in it if you drive far. I, I'm a tall person, so I always get in and just see if I fit without my head hitting the ceiling. And believe it or not, there are lots of cars I just don't fit in without halfway reclining, which is not a comfortable position to drive in, especially if you want to stay awake while doing so. All right. Uh, anything else we need to talk about today as we've, uh, we've made it all the way through the day for day one and day two? I drive nowhere. <laughs> Eighties music band. I tried to look up Ohio Gin. I failed. Did someone block each other? Never know. Captioning is a hoot. We've left it on for a little while, even though the audio is a little bit clearer with the uh, 
with the gate turned on, the noise gate, that means that the, the sound has to reach a certain point of volume before it actually, we hear it. So it cuts out all the little, just the background noise. Um, but when the, when the sound turns on, you hear the background noise and the person talking. That's the only trade-off. Kia Soul, it's roomy and zippy. I'm five foot ten with a spinal fusion. Uh, I am not five foot ten. I'm I'm six two ish. I'm six two ish. Got a Honda CRV because my husband didn't hit his head when he got in. Surprised I didn't go for a white Honda Sonata. It's probably a stolen vehicle. I'm just guessing. Anyone in the fall solar eclipse zone? When is this going to happen? It's it's got to be soon, right? Let's do a quick check. Hey, Twitter. I could probably ask Weatherwatch. You could tell us. Let's see. April 8th. April 8th. Total solar eclipse in the U.S. Let me see the uh, the flight path. I'm pretty sure it goes up like through New York and stuff. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Rochester. Right through Buffalo. Right through Buffalo, New York. April 9th, oops, it's a Monday. It's in April, April 8th, I think. Yes for the eclipse. I know Home Depot was selling eclipse viewing glasses and eclipse viewing lenses for your phone and and everything. Let's see. Where else? Oh, okay, here's, here's the map, here's the map. Let me pull this over to camera seven. I shall show you the map here that I'm looking at on top of flight radar because nothing's going on in, in Boise right now on flight radar. This is the map courtesy of the National Eclipse um, Twitter account. I don't think it's anything official, but... Uh, so if you're, if you're in this path, if you're in this path... And this is, we're talking from San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth, Dallas, Little Rock, Conway, Jonesboro, Cape Girardeau, um, Carbondale, Evansville, Terre Haute, uh, Bloomington, Indianapolis, Muncie, Dayton. This is hard to read. Uh, Toledo, Cleveland, Akron or Akron, Cleveland, sorry about that. Um, Erie, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Burlington, or Montpelier, or all the way up here on you know the, some of the provinces in Canada. This is where the, uh, the total eclipse will be visible along this path. So uh, if you're in this area, that's the prime viewing zone. You, you'll still be able to view some of it, but it won't be a total eclipse for anyone who's outside that, if you're either north or south. So... I'm I'm way over here, um, underneath the Owen Henderson, I think, somewhere in that area, and uh, I I might get a little shade, but but I don't know <laughs> I don't know how bad it's going to be. Land Rover is good for tall people. Land Rover Defender. I've never been in a Land Rover. My house is in the total eclipse area. Courtney Meek, uh, now is the time to post it on Airbnb for ridiculous amounts of money. Um, I'm just saying the the people in this area, especially the big cities, they are expecting a huge influx, massive influx. So many people want to be there for that. I've, I've been there near, I've, I've had a, a, like a, I don't know, 75% is what we had, or probably a little up from that. Oh man, more news. Oil refinery plant explosion in Ohio. Numerous firefighters and other emergency crews were responding to an explosion that occurred in Glis at Glycerin Traders Oil Refinery Plant in Defiance, Ohio. This is from Raw Alerts on Twitter. Reports indicate multiple victims have been exposed to chemicals. Multiple witnesses reported seeing black smoke and debris flying from the oil refinery plant. Police are urging people to avoid the area. It's not yet known on how many people have been injured as the situation is still developing. Defiance, Ohio. I uh, just had a refinery explosion. Yeah, so Ohio Gin, just saying, be careful. Um, anyway, I was I was going to tell you the eclipse that I experienced. It was it was crazy. It was crazy how 
the temperature dropped so suddenly as the eclipse came on and how birds just got quiet and it was it was just it was like almost eerie and and all the shadows of like light streaming through the trees all the shadows instead of just being like gray on the ground were like miniature pictures of the eclipse you could like look on the ground and see like a million different sun being suns being covered by the moon crazy experience you've got it if, if you get a chance to do it it's, it's awesome all right um very eerie Next eclipse will be 2044. No wonder they want to see it now. It's a long wait, Barb. Crickets start making noise. My, my aunt is having an eclipse party. in Fred, Fredericksburg, y'all can come. Come on down to Fredericksburg for a party. Oh, no, BP workers killed in Ohio. Oh, no, Kathy, that's awful. I was in the woods. It was eerie, and I'll never forget the feeling. Where the watch flipped to the chat switch. Is it not showing? I don't know why that switch is not working for you guys. A question about the thumbnail on burner. Uh, let me check the burner for that one, Steve N. And I know you have access now, so let's let's see. Trying to look for your, your question. Just one second. Still have the scanner going in the, the other ear, so. Let's see. What do you think of the brown Saturn car with the shells on and around it? Let me uh, let me take a quick peek at let's get out of there and go here. Saturn, <laughs> the Saturn with the shells around it. Nice. Uh, I like it. I like it. It looks good. It's, it's coming along nicely. You guys are doing great. I like the I like the references not being too far obscure, so you can still like view it and say, "Oh, well, that's funny." It's a it's a Saturn a vehicle. It's a car. It's a Saturn. That was pretty good. Okay, I think I think that's all. I think we're done. I think we're done for the day. I'm gonna I'll keep my ear to the ground as far as what's going on in Idaho. If something massive develops, or if something else massive develops, we'll go live with that. Um, let me do a quick poll before we leave. So don't go anywhere. Hang on, quick poll. This this trial is hard to listen to, and I understand that it is. Um, so I'm gonna ask you guys if you want to bail on this trial or stick with it. Um, Should we stick with this trial? Uh, let me know if you want it. I, I won't be offended. If you say no, I will not be offended. Uh, I'd like to do something that uh, that you enjoy as well. This is a tough one. The audio is has been um, it's been tricky to say the least. Uh, it's mostly I like just hanging out with you guys. So whatever it is we do, uh, that's fine. I will tell you that, uh, that all these videos are available if we decide to not do, and, and currently not stick, the no option um, is, is winning on the poll. Do we stick with this trial? No is winning, and, and we'll abide by that. But uh, if no wins, I'll tell you where to find this. Obviously, this is on um, Judge David Wolf's YouTube channel. It's going way back into the, the eighth month of 2021. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of video. There's a lot of, of little tiny videos that, that make this up. I think it goes for about a week um, in the first section and then about a week in the second section because it's a two-parter, the trial is. Um, obviously, we don't have to stick around for all of it. So 60-40 uh, is, is we bail on the trial. So the, the people have spoken, says Janelle. Zachary Anderson was a really good watch. I I may as as stuff develops in that case because I realize they're they're probably close to filing 
their appeal. I think an appeal is going to be filed soon because it, it was like six months um, just to get the um, the transcript and things like that. So when we when that goes down, we might we might take another look at that. Obviously, we might uh, invite his brother on again. Solomon was uh, was great to interview, uh, very respectful, even though we disagreed on on a lot of things. Um, it was a wonderful interview. I I would welcome him on again if he wants to do that. But if especially if something is moving forward with that case, I will I'll reach out and see if we can possibly get a hold of Shannon from the uh, the Crumbly trial. She's the attorney that I owe an apology to for the sorry counter. <laughs> but uh, Michelle, what will we watch now? We looking at the looking at the upcoming list. Here's what we've got. We've got. Uh, Robert Tellis starting about Tuesday next week, if, if that happens. If, uh, that's 326. I'm not sure if that's the trial date or if that's his next hearing. Chad Daybell is 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 April 1st. Um, and then we, we get to Shannon Gardner, Rust, um, happening again with sentencing, which may not happen now that there's a motion. Uh, Scott Peterson. Ooh, something's happening here. Hang on. Oh, it's a brush fire grass fire in Idaho. It would be great to hear from Shannon. I, I hope to be able to reach out to her. There's a trial in New Hampshire. Uh, yes. The, I believe the trial in New Hampshire, that is that the Tevil or is that, hang on what it is. That's, that's like Timothy Verrill or something like that. That one, there's no pool camera for, is my understanding. There's just one person that has the rights to that. And, and so it's, it's not something we can use and share. Um, we can't get pool access that way. So we might go to Judge Boyd. Um, we might, we might, uh, might look a little bit at Judge Cedric tomorrow, as just as we wait for, for some of these bigger trials to start. It's just a little lull period between them. Um, you know, it's a lull period because all the other big channels are, are doing like reviews and, and summations from other trials as we wait for the next one to start. It's just how it goes in the, the world of true crime. You could comment on the Karen Reed motion from today. I need to look back and see what happened with Corey Richens first. Uh, Karen Reed motion. I have not seen that one yet. Um, but I think we'll do some court hopping tomorrow with some of our, our old favorites to see what's up. Man, I wish, I wish, uh, the Tennessee arraignments still were live. I wish that was something we could still follow. Man, I miss those. All right. I think that's it. I think that's all. Why does that sound weird? No, it's just my ears. That's all. All right. Wonderful day today. I appreciate you guys. I'm going to actually, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to go start banging on walls and, uh, so, uh, Martha, I have made the audio. I've made some major. I've, I've never edited audio as much as I've edited this trial's audio. Made some major, major changes. Uh, check mod chat. Let me see what's up in mod chat. Ooh. Let me let me see on that one. When does this one start? I'll have to look. We might, I don't know, I might need some help to see if we can get some late access to that. Are we going to rewatch the Treehouse trial? Yes. When is it going to happen? I haven't, I haven't heard if we've got a court date on the Treehouse trial yet. Franklin Tucker, is that 6-1? Is that July 1st? Or that's June 1st, 6. I, I did the math on my hands. Zimmy, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who's helping with the, uh, with the, um, the thumbnail as well. That was wonderful. Uh, missing in Henderson, Tennessee. Sebastian Rogers, 15 years old, 5'5", five 120 pounds with blonde, brown blonde hair. Last seen on 226, wearing black sweatshirt pants and barefoot. Slated, slated his mom. $3,000 reward. Justice Jane, thank you. Good luck. Good luck to all those down there. Keep your eyes open. Tonight, when you go home, please hug the people you love. Smile at someone make their day just a little bit better. And please stay safe. We go live again tomorrow morning right about 8.30 to 9 o'clock. <laughs> See you guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.
When are we going to break for lunch, Judge? Because he's the guy!